the research director at the Center for Indian Economy in Puerto Rico. We have Professor Fernando Tormo Zaponte, who's assistant professor of sociology at the University of Pittsburgh. We have Jennifer Hinojosa, Centro's director of research. And over there on the monitor, we have Federico Centron, who um, partners with us through El Puente. He's a Puerto Rico. Yeah, he's a director in Puerto Rico of El Puente. Um, and with that, Yanmar, I'm going to turn it over to you. And I just wanted to note that El Puente is uh, co-sponsoring this event today. Um, so this event, uh, as Cristel said, um, came together uh, through our immediate reactions to what was unfolding after Hurricane Fiona. Uh, I myself was uh, taken aback by feeling, not that we were repeating again, but that we were actually going back to the starting point of, of these recovery issues. And my concern was to, that we would be repeating the same mistakes. You know, I personally, after Hurricane Maria, I started gathering water filters, doing everything I could, and, and then uh, some of the initial instincts that I had were not the most uh, sound ones. <laughs> and so uh, with that in mind, how do we rethink recovery and rethink it in relationship to the decolonizing initiative? Because in fact, we don't necessarily want to recover. We don't want to go back to some of the things that we had going on in Puerto Rico before Fiona or before Maria. So how do we not just recover, but reimagine um, our response to disasters and to climate change? And so with that said, each panelist is going to offer some brief remarks, and then we will be moving to a response and Q&A. And I think um, as part of the teaching, I, do, I don't want us to think of this as like, here are the answers. You ask us questions, we give you the answers. We are here to think together. And so uh, the, the, it's more of a discussion um, than a Q&A. So Vitak, do you want to kick off? Sure thing. First off, thank you very much, Yarimar. Thank you to the Central staff. Thank you to El Puente and the Mellon Foundation for actually helping us put this together. Uh, I've been, like Yarimar said, I survived both events in Puerto Rico. I work for a think tank, and we have been really thinking deeply about many of these issues. And so we're going to share in this very brief time period, I have like maybe three minutes to talk to you with some of the lessons. I'm going to share with you some of the lessons that I've been learning over time and some things that have popped up in my head immediately after Fiona, so that you can get a sense a little bit of some of the policy as well as the programmatic as well as the emotional parts of uh, what I'm learning as, I, as this unfolds. The first lesson is that uh, local communities and local governments are our first and most important line of defense. We saw this in Maria. We've seen it again in Fiona. Mayors, community organizations, community groups at the local level are saving lives. They're still saving lives. And I think that sadly uh, and worryingly, um, austerity budgets and austerity programs are actually strangling a lot of that infrastructure. They are taking away an important line of defense for the people of Puerto Rico. This has been done over years through austerity programs that have started uh, more formally in 2005 with certain Puerto Rican government practices and put into overdrive by the congressionally appointed uh, fiscal control board that's operating a lot of our fiscal situation as well as our economic decision making in Puerto Rico. So that's my first lesson. Austerity can kill us. And if we keep strangling our local governments, if we keep strangling local capacity, what we're going to have is really unfortunate event, events on the ground. The second lesson is we cannot wait uh, for federal agencies to define our emergency management systems, our emer emergency managed response and our reconstruction process. Uh, what we've seen is that the reconstruction after Maria has taken an unusually and painfully long time. This is due to many factors which we can discuss in the Q&A, but primordially because the emergency management system created by the federal government is broken, and it doesn't necessarily serve the needs and the important uh, rescue operations, for example, at the local level. So we cannot wait for the federal government to give us a set of instructions we need to start developing our own governing systems to actually deploy a reconstruction that serves us all. And that actually leads us to recovery. Reconstruction and recovery are two different things. Again, we can talk about this in the Q&A. I can expand on that. What do we need then? We need oversight that works. We don't need an oversight board imposed by Congress. We need to take advantage of the current moment and the wave of civic engagement that we're seeing and that we see after each disaster um, to create structures, local structures that are empowered to monitor, to evaluate, 
uh, existing agencies, and also report on the progress and independently audit a lot of what the government, our local government is doing, and the federal government is doing. And what are they doing with regards to the reconstruction? This is part of an idea that we floated, uh, I think it was yesterday, our center for the center I work for, uh, to create something akin to the Sandy Task Force, but that it involves local leaders and local communities in the decision-making process and in governance structures that actually monitor the reconstruction. My third point is that uh, Hurricane Maria was a turning point for our housing sector. As many of you may or may not know, uh, Puerto Rico is undergoing a terrible housing crisis. Access to affordable housing is rampantly bad. Um, a lot of families are you know, facing functional homelessness. A lot of people are not being able to access affordable housing. Our, the lines for Section 8 housing and for public housing projects are swelling uh, and increasing uh, exponentially. And at the same time, a lot of people in Puerto Rico cannot find a, a place to live that's affordable and stable and safe. And so Hurricane Maria has a lot to do with that. What we saw in the immediate months after Hurricane Maria, 2017 and 2018, was a drop in prices, thanks in part to um, basically the destruction caused by the hurricane. That opened a window of opportunity for outside investors and also local investors to start buying up property in Puerto Rico. Over 400,000 housing units were badly affected by the hurricane. That's about a third of our housing stock. So you can imagine the scarcity of housing creates an opportunity for a lot of people to sweep up existing and safe and stable units, pay a premium, and leave a lot of people in the streets with regards to access to housing. What we've also seen is that increase, a lot of increases in housing prices and in rental prices. In general, in Puerto Rico over the past two years, 20% increases we've seen with regards to rental prices and housing prices. That's a lot for folks who are trying to figure out if that's a little or, two or not. Uh, and one way to measure that is that salaries have not been going up in the same proportion. And so when housing prices are going up really fast and salaries are not, you have a huge problem in your hands. We did some research, I mean by we, my colleague Raul Santiago Bartolome and Enrique Figueroa, where we figured out that places with, um, places with high rental prices and places with higher housing prices were places that were, for the most part, uh, suffered a lot of damages places that were very slow to recover, and also places where there are jobs. So the combination of these factors creates a unique opportunity for a very specific investor class to poach housing that's badly needed. What can we do? We need to devise policies and programs that actually help us control housing prices, help us control rental prices, and allow people more access to stable housing in Puerto Rico. One last point. Government is all but one player. Uh, nonprofit organizations in the philanthropic sector needs to help us out and they need to step up. But at times we saw this in Maria, organizations who don't have the capacity were forced to do projects that spread them out too thin. And so a lot of them failed trying with, you know, what we normally call mission creep. Foundations dangle money in front of you. You want to take it because you want to do all this work, but you're not capable of doing it. Another thing that we saw was that Parachuting organizations and nonprofits took their photo ops, came in, uh, did their song and dance, and then left. And so, why has the reconstruction taken so long? A lot of the resources have been sucked out uh, by perhaps well meaning organizations who don't know Puerto Rico really well, found it's a mess, it's very complicated, and then left immediately. <laughs> so, what do we need? We need organizations to critically evaluate uh, their performance and be very critical about what they can and can't take on. Uh, so that they act accordingly, uh, and foundations that have been committed to Puerto Rico for the long haul, they need to lead the way, and they need to show their partners in positions of power how to work in Puerto Rico and how to stay in Puerto Rico for as long as it, we need it so that we can have a stable infrastructure, a stable funding infrastructure to move forward. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Deepak. When I think about decolonizing recoveries, I think about the need to subvert juridical political control over infrastructures that sustain life in Puerto Rico. Particularly, I've done work in the area of energy, where we've seen that the lack of control from communities and involvement from communities in the management of our energy infrastructure has led to the adoption of austerity policies that severely uh, diminished our ability to sustain power in the wake of uh, major extreme uh, weather events like 
uh, Hurricane Maria and now Hurricane Fiona. We see this in the area of energy, for instance, with drastic uh, reductions of the line worker workforce, uh, which of course are frontline workers when we lose power. And we know that when we lose power, uh, people die. Uh, so this is a very specific example of what Deepak mentioned, that austerity does indeed kill. Uh, I think also of battling transparency issues. One of the things that we're facing right now with the privatization of our energy infrastructure is that the kind of study that I did back after uh, Hurricane Maria where we found that crews were deployed quicker to areas that were supportive of the ruling party and areas that were less socially uh, vulnerable is hard to do right now because the utility considers crew deployments to be proprietary information. And we no longer have the kind of uh, authority that we had in the past when I was calling every day for about 100 days after Hurricane Maria, the Puerto Rico uh, Electric Power Authority uh, telling them this data is uh, in the public's interest and the Supreme Court has been very clear about our right to gain access to data that is deemed to be in the public's interest. There does not seem to be a lot of appetite, I believe, within the local legislature in terms of getting more transparency from uh, Luma, uh, the private firm that now manages our energy infrastructure, beyond trying to know what their outrageous salaries are. <laughs> and of course, you know, we're interested in that, but mm -hmm. We're also interested in where are they sending their crews? Because that has life and death implications. Mm -hmm. um, when I think about decolonizing recovery, I also think about challenging the idea that people um, experiencing these disasters are unable to manage the infrastructures that sustain their lives. I think about challenging the idea of governing through neoliberal logics and assuming that these logics are the solution to Puerto Rico's ills. We know that neoliberalism fails forward in the context of Puerto Rico, and yet it continues to be the dominant logic that informs governance in Puerto Rico, not just in disaster management, but governance more generally. When I think about decolonizing recovery, and I'll end with this last point, I think about investing ourselves in community-rooted projects that not just enable survival, because survival is not enough. Communities should be able to thrive, not just survive. And I think that we have examples of communities that are engaged in struggles that seek to do more than just survive. When we think, for instance, about communities that have to develop their own community aqueducts, and in order to operate these aqueducts, because the local water utility does not provide drinking water to them, and the local power authority doesn't provide energy to power up these aqueducts and to be able to pump out this water to the community, they've had to develop their own energy generation systems at the local level. And that is how communities like Corcovada and Añasco have been able to provide water to their people. These are examples to me of Puerto Rico's ability and, and people who are experiencing these disasters to enable solutions, to enable alternative approaches to uh, recovering, but not just recovering, to rebuilding, reimagining, and again, not just surviving, but also thriving. Thank you. Um, so lessons learned from Maria and that I see that keeps happening even now with Hurricane Fiona. We need to look at disasters beyond the San Juan metropolitan area, right? And I think with that being said, that this looking beyond the San Juan metro area, it needs to be from the federal and state level, right? Sometimes getting resources people leave, living in these rural areas, they won't get it you know, as fast as those that live in the San Juan metropolitan area. And that goes to the electricity, right, as well. Mm -hmm. um, the forgotten population. I mean, I've seen so many reports about the 
migration numbers, how many people left Puerto Rico to, to the state sides, or how many students left, right? But what we didn't hear much during Maria, right, was those with disabilities, population with disabilities, our senior age population that keeps growing, right, year after year. Um, for example, let me feed you this data point, 38.3% of Puerto Rico's senior age population live in poverty. Now, if we compare that to the US, the nation as a whole, it's 9.4%. So, you know, 38.3 versus what, 9.4%. 9, 9 and you sort of, you cover that with disaster, a COVID-19 pandemic. You can only imagine the challenges they are facing on the ground. And lastly, the disabled population. A report that um, our director, Yarimar, and I released, we saw that Guanica had the highest total percentage of disabled population. But yet, you know, they today do not have energy, as my colleague here, um, Fernando, stated. They, they're still without energy. So all this layers of vulnerability, right? We need to take a step back because you need, you know, you look at things from the macro level, meso and micro, that these challenges of these forgotten people that, you know, we don't really see what they, you know, go through. And lastly, when we think about um, our senior age population and disabled population, something as simple as, you know, needing to refrigerate your insulin right, medication and you don't have power, you know, that's a major challenge as well. So just to sum all, sum of all of this up, we need to look at beyond the San Juan metropolitan area. We need to remember about our forgotten population and that recovery needs to, you know, this, it's, it's, it's atrocious that, you know, we're still talking about this today, five years later. Thank you. Federico. Hello, Federico. <laughs> Zooming in from Puerto Rico. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Um, I, my comments are uh, obviously closely related to what has been said before. Just a little bit of background here at the Programa de Puente in Puerto Rico. Um, our main topic uh, is climate change and climate justice. So, a lot of what we do. It has to do with um, education about those topics, but we also have uh, projects and modeling projects, um, kind of like connecting to what Fernando is saying, um, providing solar systems to community centers to uh, basically grow that capacity to, to confront uh, some of the things that we are discussing today. And that is something that actually uh, came out of the work that we did uh, after Hurricane Maria. So we decided that you know our focus was going to change and, and put it into, into building more uh, capacity in the community for the, for the things that we've been discussing today. Um, there are three, three main points that I would like to make as well. Um, the first one is that, um, as I've been discussed before, um, kind of like the way that, that the response has been is very similar to Maria in the sense that we have like two main tracks, the governmental track and the civil society track. And for many in the discussions in social media, those tend to be uh, portrayed as parallel things happening at the same time. I, I would argue that they're not as disconnected as uh, many people um, made them seem, and I think one of the first things that I, I want to bring up is that we need to understand uh, those connections better and how um, they're definitely are moved by uh, different visions of how to deal with the, with the recovery um, and the response, and it's clearly that the government way of doing things as has been described in the media um, is, is, is not, uh, it doesn't have a, a, any type of um, social justice uh, framework that guide the way that they are responding to, to what happened. 
didn't have it in Maria. It doesn't happen. It hasn't happened in, in, in Fiona either. And in the case of the civic society, I think that there's more of that. Um, but but my point here is that it's not sustainable. So, so what we're seeing uh, is not sustainable and it's not desirable. And I think that's my main point. Even though we're seeing two different ways of, of dealing with the response, um, it's not that only that it's not enough, it's just that it's gonna keep us uh, responding to these emergencies in the same way, which brings me to my second point, is that we, we really need a change of paradigm from an emergency focus to an adaptation focus. And I think that's, that's, that's crucial because even the way that uh, all, the, all the things that Deepak was mentioning, for example, of, on the way that the federal money uh, has, been, um, has been really a mess since Maria, uh, I think that that framework of FEMA, of responding and thinking that putting money on top of money is the way that we are gonna deal with the emergency it hasn't worked. We've seen it. It hasn't worked. And waiting for that money to be um, put into a reconstruction of that infrastructure that never happened have only made us more vulnerable and have um, raised the levels of exposure. So, so in that sense, that chief of paradigm that is connected also with what Deepa mentioned before of generating our own local frameworks for, for response and reconstruction is very important. And as long as we continue to have this idea that emergencies are fortuitous, they might come or they might not come. Therefore, if they come, I do something to mitigate the damage. If they don't come, then we keep living the way we are. That, that cannot be the way uh, anymore. Climate change is here. And, and many things are happening that are not only hurricanes, which bring me to my next point. Um, three days after Fiona passed, we had a high temperature alert in Puerto Rico. We have temperatures of 114 degrees and people didn't have water or energy to deal with the high heat. So when we talk about climate change, we're talking about confounding risks that are happening at the same time, but the framework of the emergency doesn't work that way. The framework of the emergency work related to a specific phenomena and a specific emergencies. So it doesn't have the climate, uh, the climate change uh, framework is not part of it. And that's something that we need to keep studying and we need to keep put more attention and, and really reframe that. Um, Paulo Mendes from the University of Puerto Rico have put together a really nice graphic from 2017 to 2022 of the compounding um, phenomena that had happened since Maria. And it's overwhelming to see in those five years, all the things that had happened that doesn't account for Fiona. So Fiona will be one more. And maybe, you know, from here to December, we get something else. So, so I guess that um, that's, that's my, my, my second or third point. You know, we have to, we have to change that mind frame and also um, really talk about a, Dependency, you know, and, and this is this is at all levels. All the issues that we're talking about has to do with a lack of self determination in whether we can produce the food that we consume, in whether we can produce the energy that we're using instead of bringing it from outside and having to wait to for the Jones Act to be a to be lift up for, for, you know, for gas to come into Puerto Rico. Um, so the issue of dependency have to be a uh, bring to the table and, and talk much about it because right now uh, the large infrastructure um, projects are all envisioned 
through the framework of the emergency money and their emergency funding. And that is completely unsustainable. And the way that is happening today, that only 3% have been spent, is, you know, that, that um, is not, um, it's not practical, it's not functioning, it's not, it's not gonna work. Um, so my last point uh, that I wanna make is that um, there are several initiatives that, um, that are really going on. And I think that um, both in, in the diaspora in Puerto Rico, we, we need to put more pressure on it uh, on top of some of the things that were mentioned before as transparency, as legal framework, et cetera. And one of them being uh, the, the mitigation and adaptation and resiliency plan for Puerto Rico is part of law 33, 2019. And it was supposed to be approved in 2019, in October. It wasn't. Um, we actually took the Department of Natural Resources to court uh, to try to force them to come up with the, and approve that plan because that's just the tip of the iceberg. But um, our hope is that it can move the discussion towards a more systematic organized discussion about climate adaptation and we can really understand the relationship of mental health and climate change of lack of energy and climate change of the distance between uh, the san juan area and the rural area and climate change the closing of the schools we can really have a more a comprehensive and complex view of the things that are happening so that we can start developing those uh, long-term frameworks for not only response, but also uh, adaptive measures. So to conclude, what we're seeing now, as we're seeing in other poor countries around the world, is that we have high levels of exposures combined with low levels of adaptive capacity. And that's, that's kind of like what we're seeing uh, right now. I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you, Federico, I was really, really wonderful set of, of comments and remarks. I, I, I want to throw out a few ideas of my own. We have a question in the chat. Uh, I want to, you know, make sure everyone's getting their questions bubbling up. Uh, you know, you talk about the relationship between mental health and climate change. I think that's so important. You know, scholars have written about this phenomenon of Katrina brain, you know, mm -hmm. like the impact that the repetitive trauma of uh, Katrina had on those who experienced that. I've been asking myself, what in the world could be like Maria Terremoto Austeridad Fiona Brain, <laughs> you know? And, and pandemic. 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 Pandemic brain. Yeah. Or boof. Ni hablemos de eso. So, you know, and what, you know, and, and uh, also the issue of, you know, we've talking about decoloniz decolonizing recovery was kind of the catchphrase for this. You know, some, some folks tell me that I need to not go too hard on FEMA, but you know, part of the problem for Puerto Ricans is that we can't reimagine recovery, right? We have to engage with FEMA uh, because we're not able to create our own FEMA that, that, that speaks to our necessities, right? And also FEMA uh, was created to attend to a certain set of emergencies in the 1950s and, and disaster recovery um, operated very differently then in relationship to the New Deal, often uh, recovery engaged in, in a different kind of long-term projects. FEMA was then uh, placed under homeland security and emergencies began to be rethought as responses to terrorist attacks, right? And so that, that was, you know, we, we still don't fully know to what extent that has limited the ability of, of FEMA to respond to the era of climate change that it, that requires a different kind of speed, a different kind of recovery, because there's also a constant um, emphasis on temporary solutions to make spaces habitable, um, to kind of a kind of immediate uh, focus on survival, as Fernando was saying. Um, and there's just not enough time now to you know, put those Band-Aids and patchwork solutions into place because those Band-Aids are all gonna get ripped off immediately, right? So we have to think about also the temporality of recovery in addition to decolonizing. Let me bring in um, some questions from the chat. Um, Norma Melendez asks, why has the grid not been decentralized? Is the Puerto Rican government responsible for this neglect? Fiona was a category one 
and the entire island lost power. And I want to piggyback onto Norma a question that I've been getting a lot and I don't have a good answer for is there's a general call for canceling the Luma contracts. But if it cancels, then what happens? Does it revert back to the government? I don't know if Fernando or Deepak have any thoughts about that. <laughs> so I eat the bombita uh, about energy. Federico, you want to comment about that? Uh, well, it, sure. I feel like I have to. I mean, I'm, we're also part of the Queremos Sol coalition, so and we do have uh, answers for <laughs> for those questions. And our answer. Uh, mm -hmm. is that yes, we need to decentralize the, the system. We have to do it using um, solar energy on rooftop with batteries connected to a general grid, and then we'll move the excess of energy producing the houses to, to where it needs to go. Um, uh, it has been proven by studies, it's backed up by studies that it can be done. Uh, we have claimed that some of that money, the recovery money is being used to do that. Um, and really, the answer from, from, <clears throat> from the government is that they have a different plan. <laughs> they have a plan to privatize the, the lasting power plants in Puerto Rico. They want to keep promoting um, natural uh, gas, uh, and they want to do it as a transition uh, fuel, which has been demonstrated once and again that there's no need for that and we can move right away to develop solar energy. Um, but they do have a plan. I mean, this is not a, um, I guess the answer is that it, it's not that there's not another option, is that the option that the government has decided to promote and to push forward um, is the one that we're seeing right now. Um, the, the governor today still defends the work of Luma in Puerto Rico and says that, you know, it's what it was expected and it's fine, you know, and it might be not perfect, but um, the contract is gonna stay and 15 more years. So there are answers for these things and, and there are solutions that have been uh, brought up by a multi-sector coalition in Puerto Rico and it has been supported uh, by research and, and by other experts inside and outside of Puerto Rico. These are great questions and um... So the first one was, why hasn't the energy grid been decentralized? Well, I mean, there, in theory, is funding to develop local capacities for energy generation in Puerto Rico. Uh, beyond the main coal-fueled uh, energy generation plants. But we can't forget that the Trump administration engaged in well-documented efforts to block the disbursement of aid in Puerto Rico, right? Um, I'm not saying that the Biden administration has done wonders, but from 2017 to 2020, there was an administration in place that blocked the disbursement of that funding. Um, and then there's the question of, how much should we decentralize? I'm very much in favor of decentralizing, but I think we should push for a polycentric system. What does that look like? It looks like a system that has multiple centers of energy generation, and we keep our transmission lines. Because if a community develops a microgrid, and that community no longer, for whatever reason it might be, cannot produce local energy, they will need those transmission lines so that we can reallocate energy generated in other areas to areas that don't have that energy. So the solutions to our problem is not just going full decentralization. Yes, we wanna have local capacities. And decentralization can also be a very neoliberal system, right? The idea that everybody needs to own a house and to have money to finance solar panels mm -hmm. and batteries, uh, which by the way have also uh, climate consequences where do you think these are going to be dumped in 20 years? Not in Condado, right? <laughs> uh, who's going to dump them, right? Who's, who's going to have them in their backyard? 
we already know where we dump uh, what we use to produce energy in Puerto Rico. Um, it's not in Condado. <laughs> so another problem is that a lot of burdens are placed on the local government, which is not willing or prepared to adopt the burdens of accessing federal money to decentralize the system. Instead, they are invested in a technocracy whereby McKinsey is one of the major uh, actors uh, in terms of the governance of Puerto Rico. So the government is not very willing to do this either, even if there wasn't a Trump administration that had blocked this. And to your point, uh, Yarimar, about what happens after Luma, this is where decolonizing a recovery matters, is the ability to imagine alternatives. And to we, we should avoid the danger of boxing ourselves into the idea that there are only two alternatives for Puerto Rico's energy grid. Uh, PREPA, as we had it under, uh, when, when we had Maria, or LUMA, now under Fiona. If you look at energy generation and distribution in other states that are exposed to extreme weather events like uh, Texas or Florida, they have multiple cooperatives that generate energy. They're, they aren't the best examples to follow. They are usually, it's dirty energy. But we could empower communities, or let me say communities could empower themselves to be energy producers and distributors uh, so that we're not stuck in this dichotomy of either you know, a, major, a centralized system of, of Luma and over, an over-reliance on a foreign, n newly formed, inexperienced firm versus PREPA, which was used uh, for political gain by the majority parties in Puerto Rico. This has been well documented. PREPA was, uh, was exploited. Uh, and the workers in PREPA were often seen as foot soldiers for the lo local political parties. So I just want to piggyback real quick on that last point Fernando made, which I think was spot on. Uh, our organization, the Center for an Economy, has done extensive analysis on the Luma contract on our website, www.grupocne.org. My colleague Sergio Maiswatch has written extensively about the structure of the contract and what can happen, the different uh, legal pathways that the Luma contract can, can go through. Um, so I won't dwell on that. I'll focus more on the political economy question, which is how this has been set up uh, in a political, in such a scenario where we'll railroad it into a Tina situation, there is no alternative situation. That's what you know Tina stands for, mm -hmm. and and what it implies is that it's an either or game, as Fernando is saying, and the matter, the the situation at hand that we have is if the Luma contract is canceled on November 30, where certain trigger clauses are activated as a result of a very complicated series of events regarding the debt restructuring of the power authority and the likes, reverting back to PREPA is not a thing that can happen overnight, one. And second, uh, it's an undesirable position that we, want to find our, that, that we don't want to find ourselves in, right? So at the same time, the key question we have to ask ourselves is, are those the only two options? And what has happened in between when we started seeing the signs on the wall that the, this organization, this company, was not meeting even the basic standards? Did the government and did all of us come up with an alternative scenario, a series of alternative scenarios. I know several civic organizations have, but why hasn't the government even started thinking about alternative scenarios in a very plausible context where the debt the restructuring process and the legal configuration of the contract could have triggered a situation where we find ourselves in a limbo scenario that could be the worst possible situation of all, right? So the lack of imagination or the overt effort to railroad us into a specific pathway is something we need to question. And this comes back to our issue of decolonizing and governance of our major public services in Puerto Rico. And I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Can we get some questions from the room? Mm -hmm. I mean, Lautier is part of the reason why we no longer have PREPA doing distribution and transmission, partly because this was an attack on one of the strongest unions in Puerto Rico, which also happened to have often student solidarity with other struggles 
I remember very vividly when I was a student in the University of Puerto Rico during a 62-day-long occupation that Utier stood with us, right? Um, and Utier was demonized. It still is. If you comb through the comment section of a Nuevo Dia or, your, or, or Twitter Puerto Rico, <laughs> there is an obsession with Jaramillo, with the leader of Utier, who does not have authority over the deployment of crews at all. Nothing to do with it. Nothing. In fact, the New Progressive Party alleged after Hurricane Maria that crews were being sent to the house, to the areas where there were Utier uh, people living. Well, they poked the monster and they started an investigation under La Comisión de los Asuntos del Oeste. This investigation did not last long because what they found was that crews were not actually going to Utier uh, employees. They were actually going to their own people. So, you know, Utier has been propped up as, uh, it's, it's really, in, in, in my opinion, has been an excuse for uh, privatization. Interestingly, when they, uh, when Luma takes over distribution and transmission in Puerto Rico and Utier employees decide not to, some utility empl employees decide not to work for Luma, mm -hmm. they all of a sudden have spread Utier employees throughout the local government. And it'll be interesting to see the extent to which Utier actually comes out of this stronger because mm -hmm. they might organize other sectors that they, in the past, didn't organize. Um, I want to move away a little bit from politics, even though this is probably political. But, well, because this is going to be political anyway. Um, <laughs> just because a um, little bit of context. So I did field work in Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria. My grandmother died as a result. So this is very personal to me, but it's reliving a trauma. Um, I, I stay away from footage as much as I can. Like, I want to stay informed. But it's kind of like, oh, it's, it's like it's not a new hurricane. It's like it's just happening again. Um, so I want to know if disaster um, mental health teams have been deployed to Puerto Rico. Like, what are we doing about, like, creating trauma? Because I think about the residents. I can't stop thinking about the residents. Like, I understand that we are concerned about property because if they don't have anywhere to live, then that's an issue. But, you know, they can't even go to Florida now. Um, so what's happening? Are we, like, anybody has family there? I'm, I'm just concerned about people are going to just take their lives at this point because of the PTSD and when I remember being there and nobody was even talking to the residents. Everybody was just kind of like, touched on it like a photo op. Look, look at how many roofs we've constructed. Look at us. Look at this art organization. We're the best. And I was disgusted because I was there as a student. So can anybody speak to, because I know Governor Hochul had an initiative for disaster, creating trauma-informed environments, environments and deploying clinicians and creating programs. And it hasn't even started yet. So are we going to focus on that too? I wanted to say first that, you know, with Maria, most of the deaths came afterwards, right? And so we're, we're still tallying our dead from Fiona. And those who are starting to keep statistics, they are including suicides in those statistics, and they're adding up. So that is, you know, a real, a real question. Um, I, I, and, but I also think that, you know, we have people had, that have been working in Puerto Rico uh, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Patricia Novoa, she works mm -hmm. with this uh, Clinica de Asistencia Legal y Psicológica. Mm -hmm. And so she combines legal and psychological help because she recognizes first that um, engaging with the process of asking for FEMA aid, et cetera, that requires you to enter into therapy, you know. Uh, but also that uh, it, it, you can't just also do the, the, the kind of psychological work alone without also dealing with the repair, the, the, the aid that people need. Um, and so I, I would say, I, I definitely want to hear from the rest of the panel, but 
that we have to look to how people on the ground in Puerto Rico have been thinking about this kind of assistance from that particular context. Uh, because I think sometimes, you know, an, another issue about this is that uh, foundations that sometimes donate support, et cetera, they require a level of accountability mm -hmm. that, that then um, re-traumatizes people in having to document the aid that they've received, you know? So, so we also have to think about those issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, so uh, the, there's a public agency in Puerto Rico, uh, acronym is AMSCA, mm -hmm. that deals with uh, a lot of these uh, emergencies. But um, I would not be surprised if austerity budgets have actually yeah. uh, significantly slashed their ability to mobilize more resources in a meaningful way, especially after disasters. I did hear in watching a lot of the press coverage and the press conferences from the government, the spike in calls. Uh, mm -hmm. to their hotline that have just ballooned and swelled over time, especially before the event, as people relive the trauma, but also after. I do know as well that um, this phrase we use a lot in Puerto Rico, and it's very true, solo el pueblo salva el pueblo, mm -hmm. which means only the people save the people, um, comes to mind immediately. Um, I know for a fact that uh, Universidad Carlos has, Albizu has a program in place to actually offer assistance uh, to people through a hotline, but also deploying teams. They did that in Maria. Some of the major medical schools also mobilized a lot of their students as well. Um, so we are aware that we need to save ourselves uh, because if we wait for help from above, it's probably not going to happen. And it's not going to happen because there's a plan in place to curtail the funds that are needed to actually offer this important public service. And so, you know, this puts us in a very complicated and dire situation that I think uh, and requires that, and this is a call to all of you, especially those of you who live in the United States, to raise your voices, you know, and, and, and bring the, the, the claims to Congress and bring the claims to your Congress people and to assembly people that austerity is actually killing us in Puerto Rico. And that the designs put forward by Congress to actually impose a control board that is taking away important resources. and the follow through from the government of Puerto Rico, which is basically doing the, the board's bidding, is also hampering us. So we need to change the discussion, the terms of the, of the narrative as well, of what we claim for and the advocacy that we do. And we need all your help because in Puerto Rico, we don't have that representation. Um, and you guys do. So we need all of your help as well. Federico Grito, si can I, can I just make a comment quickly? Yes, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, it's about AMSCA, and like, I don't remember seeing them in, uh, come to my house after here at Maria, but I live in, I don't know if this turned out, I don't know. Uh, I live in a municipio that was affected also by the earthquakes, and they, they, they did come through, but it was never particularly clear to me what their intention was. And I consider me sort of a smart person, so I can try and guess what they're asking, even though I have no background in psychology or any of, of the matter. It was never particularly clear that they were the people that were tasked with walking through the uh, houses and calling uh, were not just. Uh, it, it wasn't clear to me that they were trained in psychology to start, and it wasn't clear to me that they were not just there because they were assigned and they are look, trying to get through as many houses as possible mm. to finish what the report and, and go home. So I don't doubt that austerity has limited their capacity or whatever, but uh, to some degree, uh, I don't trust ANSCA mm. in, in actually achieving or knowing that what they want to achieve when they send people out. Um, obviously, that's just from a personal experience, but yeah. I just need to comment in terms of um, using the language mental health. The word trauma keeps coming up, and I think that's the word that the appropriate language to use in trauma-informed uh, when we start talking about mental health, because otherwise it appears that it's very cosmetic in terms of how we're addressing mental health issues. The other thing is um, everybody keeps addressing FEMA. I don't hear the, the National Institute of Health or National Institute of Mental Health ever being tapped in. And I know New York State has two research institutes Nathan Klein, as well as Psychiatric Institute, which they have some 
excellent research investigator, Dr. Maria Kendo, who did a lot of research on Latina suicide. I mean, the suicide rates and numbers in terms of disability, which mental health or mental illness is an invisible disability. I don't know whether that's included in terms of mm. the physical disability. So I think in terms of um, trauma, once again, in terms of what's happening in Puerto Rico, need to be in the forefront in terms of dealing with any other issue. Because when we think of health, we think of health from the neck on down and don't think of the brain as a major mm -hmm. organ, like the heart, the lungs, or anything else. Mm -hmm. So just to answer that, whether or not um, that is included into disability, it's not. It's, um, but I think that's, that raises a really important question in terms of like how do you um, sort of allocate right, funding or the necessary needs to help these individuals on the ground. And I also think, you know, we need to look into like the children, right, as well. Because mm -hmm. as, I, as I was talking to Deepak and Fernando, like, gosh, when we look at compounded effects, challenges, mm -hmm. COVID, the Hurricane Maria, earthquakes, and now Fiona, right? I just can't imagine any other state in the U.S. where a children has faced so many challenges, mm -hmm. right? Not only economic and social, but mm -hmm. all of these trauma. And I just, I, I wonder what this will look like five years down the road, right? Are we going to have a segment of the population that we're going to miss, right? How many kids dropped out of school, right? Um, so. Just to get back to that, you know, we, we also need to think about the, the school age children as well. Yeah. yeah. In terms of school age children, we talk about children and mental illness. I think that um, the creative art therapist, I'm a former activity therapist and worked with psychiatric patients, and I'm retired. And um, it's no different than medicine. Uh -huh. If you tap into the art schools, you have licensed clinicians in the field that can work with children in terms of treating them through the arts. So that's a serious consideration to look at. Yeah. OK. Good. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to pull some questions from the chat. Uh, uh, my, fav my good friend, anonymous attendee, asks, um, thank you all for this amazing panel. I'm curious to hear everyone's thoughts on whether the strategy forward is in holding the state accountable or in crafting and legitimating our survival outside of government. And I'm going to bundle that with uh, Raura Doreste asks, I understand that mutual aid and El Pueblo Salva El Pueblo is essential in the short term, but communities don't have as many resources as the government. How can we put these demands on the state? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think any answer to those tiny questions? Yeah. <laughs> Freda should also step in because he's been a little bit quiet, but I'll just say that you know, when we're talking about, you know, whether this state or private, uh, that is a, another false dichotomy that we've been trained to create these polarized ideas, right? And El Pueblo Salva El Pueblo is, is actually a, a stopgap measure, but it's also a rallying cry, mm -hmm. right? At the same time, it should not be a governance template because in many ways we could be advancing another form of neoliberal policy making and a neoliberal structure by actually putting the pressure on community groups for things and important aspects that the state should be doing. So we need to walk a fine line between being vigilant, holding the state accountable, be proposing new ideas, making our voices heard, while at the same time ensuring that the state infrastructure is built up to serve the needs of the greater good. Right? So the state needs to serve the, the greater good of the people. It needs to serve us. Right? It needs to be held more accountable. Any narrative that I hear regarding the state or, I totally dismiss immediately in my head because um, I usually like this phrase by a sociologist named Peter Evans that says, state involvement is a given. The question is not how much, but what kind. And I think that we need to start asking that kind of question over and over again as we rethink and reimagine a decolonized Puerto Rico, as we imagine a post-disaster future, 
and as we also imagine our political futures moving forward. Federico, you want to chime in? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to to the point I made about the change of paradigm. I think that's part of the the emergency framework, you know, that el pueblo salva al pueblo. Well, they're right until we can, and then we when we cannot, then no one is gonna save us. <laughs> and and I think that's that's very dangerous. And it's dangerous because um, even in the way that people who are supporting those organizations that are quick to mobilize and that are quick to response to their networks of communities uh, is also done in that short-term perspective. And you gather money and resources that you can, you send it to those uh, organizations with the hope that they are gonna provide with some basic needs, including what we talk about trauma. Um, but that is very finite, you know, and, and is, is so little at the end. I mean, it's very important, but it's so little at the end that the organizations uh, like ours and others can, can really do with all the support and all the, uh, that we're getting. Um, that's on the one hand. On the other hand is that it, it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. That, that's the, to me, that's, that's the main point. I mean, it is not sustainable. It, it, it is important. We, we need to, to continue organized. Actually, those, these uh, opportunities allow us to bring to those communities some of these discussions. And that is important. It's really important to, to, to make people aware and connecting the dots that why is it that we are here and you haven't seen your mayor? <laughs> Why is it that we are here and you haven't seen the governor? Why is it that we are here and, and you haven't seen the, the agencies that are mandated to, to provide you with, with emergency relief? And that's an important conversation. So we know that and, and, and you know, as much as we can, when we have these conversations, we bring it up and, and people understand it right away. So how do we transform that in, into political power in the better sense of the term, you know, that people are conscious of why these things are happening and how can they change for the better to do all the things that were suggested in the long term. Because, you know, that I heard today that some of the funding to clean, so in the South, there was some flooding that didn't happen after Maria and happened this time. And the residents are saying that it's because some of the channels that collect water and move the water were not uh, clear. So now there's money to clean those channels. But today they see the government said that that money cannot be used until 2024. To me, that doesn't make any sense. How are you going to tell me that the channels that prevent the communities to get flooded, it's going to take two years to have that money to do the cleaning of those channels. And what's going to happen from now to then? So they just have to wait and to cross their fingers that there's not going to be a lot of water that is going to flood their houses again. And that's, 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 that's you know, um, it's what we're seeing with all the other issues. Um, tomorrow, we're going on a brigade with a, a health providers from the University of Puerto Rico in Supeñuelas, but those are all ad hoc efforts, you know? And we're gonna go tomorrow and we wanna see what, what are we able to, to do. But the reality is that if we find cases that need long-term care and in Peñuelas in the South, the, the hospitals are not able to provide it or the clinics are not able to do the follow-up and do all these other things, we're back in the same problem. And that's what we keep saying, you know, since Maria, we are living in a constant state of emergency. We cannot talk about the one phenomena. We're talking about the accumulation of all these issues. Mm -hmm. I'll just add briefly that, um, 
I agree this is a false dichotomy. I mean, uh, there was this debate, very public uh, debate in Puerto Rico, and I think Giovanni Roberto had uh, really good contributions. He, he authored a piece uh, called Sin, Sin Pedir Perdón y Sin Pedir Permiso, mm -hmm. uh, which really said these two efforts of asking the state to step in and to engage in mutual aid are not mutually exclusive. And I think we should engage in tactical diversity. And I can see how one can feed into the other. Just to give you an example, there's a, a, a colleague and friend, uh, Marisa Reyes, who organizes with Boricua and, and other local farming uh, groups. Uh, she and others were mentioning uh, one time that we were talking that they started taking up things that the local mayor wasn't doing. Um, and all of a sudden, the mayor freaked out. And he was like, uh-oh. And next week, pristine. The mayor had, t had done everything that he had neglected. Uh, so, you know, he kind of was shamed into taking up his responsibility. And I think that's indicate, uh, an indicator of these two things aren't, aren't mutually exclusive. They can actually feed off of each other and, and, and support each other. Hi, thank you um, for doing this. My name is Laura Colón Melendez. I am. Uh, I have two, two, two questions. Like, how have other countries? Because sometimes, because of our colonialism, we don't see um, that we are but a fraction of a seven billion people world. Um, how have other countries in the world dealt with catastrophes? Because the United States, and like that's one. Because the United States has had four or five different um, category four or five storms hit the Gulf of Mexico in the last five years. Mm -hmm. um, how has FEMA handled those? So it goes to like that, that element of, uh, of imagining or comparing or just so that we can have ideas of what to demand as what's possible, right? Because I don't know if this has happened to you here in, in the diaspora, but part of what gets to me this past few weeks has been, que se hace diferente? Like how do we not fall into the same pitfalls of Maria and like, we're privileged here that we have electricity and water and all of these things, so what do we do about it? Um, yeah. So just to respond to that, I was thinking about this. When Hurricane Sandy hit, oh, when Hurricane Sandy hit uh, New York, and I am, I'm thinking back to um, Long Beach, which is like 50, 20 minutes, oh, 15 minutes away from where I live, and Long Beach is a community that literally the beach is right there. They have like a Bay Area, but it was devastated of, because of Hurricane Sandy, right? Because of the structure of these homes were like bungalows, right? So the ocean's water, there was like a storm surge, et cetera. And, but after two years, it's just like a whole different Long Beach where these homes are now on, um, they're, they're oh. rise, yeah, they're still, it's right. And it was just, and I understand like the construction of homes in Puerto Rico are, are cement, right? So I, to me, it's just like unbelievable how that area, and I, you know, we have to think about scale now because Puerto Rico is larger than Long, Long Beach, right? But then I look at Harvey, right, in, in Texas and all, the, but re, the response was a lot quicker, right? The, the recovery efforts, the change of that, right? But the change for who, right? The impact, right? The rents went high and all these like, oh, it's nicer. But I just think like just what could we do differently? What about Puerto Rico? Like what, what's the issue with, like, with what um, Federico said? They can't use that money until 2024 to clean that up. It's just unbelievable to me. But um, yeah, I mean, I've, there's so many studies that discusses the compares different disasters across different states and, and, and regions. So mm -hmm. I don't have the answer to that, mm -hmm. but I could tell you is like just looking at this, you know, from a, from afar, it's just the in, inequality and just the unjust that Puerto Rico is facing. I, there, there's a wonderful book by Professor Robert Olshansky and Laurie Johnson called After Great Disasters which actually provides a series of case studies that compare uh, disaster recovery in numerous places across time as well. And one of the cases that impressed me the most was Indonesia. Uh, in the case of, of the tsunami uh, that we all know that occurred several years ago, uh, Indonesia was actually going through a civil unrest and a civ kind of a civil war at the same time. Interestingly, uh, with all those compounding challenges in front of them, 
they were able to set up one of the disaster, one of the best international disaster recovery governance efforts that we have known to date. This is a country that's going through a civil war and that has no FEMA, right? But as international donations started pouring in, they wanted to figure out how do we organize ourselves in a way that allows us to deploy these, this aid in a more meaningful way. One of the things, and, and it's a, quite a complicated case study and I won't summarize it completely today, but one of the things that really impressed me was they use existing community structures and existing community governance structures to actually uh, get the money to where it needed to go and to receive feedback regarding plans and programs from local communities as to what they needed. So using existing structures instead of inventing new ones mm -hmm. almost always allows for a quicker deployment of funds and a more useful way of deploying much needed funds in compressed time, which is a term that Professor Olshansky invented with, with Laurie Johnson, theoretically invented. And so one of the things I ask my colleagues who, or people in government when I sit down with them and I tell them, uh, they ask, they tell me like, well, but you know, Puerto Rico is in you know, such dire situation. It's in going through austerity, it's going through this. They don't mention that they created it, but, <laughs> and, and so I ask them like, well, we're, you're comparing yourself to Florida and Texas. Let's compare ourselves to Indonesia. And let's see what they did. And they're like, they have no answer for that comparison because it doesn't even begin to enter their brains that there is another way forward that does not involve the existing federal agencies that we're uh, normally dealing with. So in imagining a, a decolonized or maybe a sovereign Puerto Rico, uh, we need to also think about how do we want to organize for climate adaptation? How do we want to organize as well for emergency response? How do we want to uh, organize regarding international aid that's going to come? Some of it with a lot of strings attached because not all the money that's going to come in is going to be very benevolent money. And so those are the kind of questions that I think we need to start asking and answering ourselves from Puerto Rico and with the help of all of you in the diaspora. I think we should invest ourselves in international and transnational struggles for climate justice to mitigate climate change, not just adapt to it. And there are already groups doing that, like through Boricuambia, Campesina, that are engaging in that. And I worry that Puerto Rico's colonial status will actually be an obstruction to us gaining access to international climate change adaptation funds that are being set up right now, particularly for small island nations. Uh, so that, that could be a, a big problem. And uh, something actually that I find very mm -hmm. fascinating is that, you know, a lot of folks in small island nations are investing in um, planting mangroves and, and restoring sand dunes. Uh, Puerto Rico is instead destroying them and building absurd projects. Um, so, you know, it's not just what to do, it's also what not to do. Uh, and, and I think uh, Deepak's uh, research with Raul, Enrique, and others is, is an example of uh, things that we're not doing very well, uh, which is the idea that we're turning a lot of uh, coastal area properties mm -hmm. into Airbnbs for folks to come and, you know, post hashtag bless. Well, they're not going to be posting hashtag bless when there's a hurricane coming. And who's going to be there to build on those social infrastructures of support uh, to identify who are the people in the community that need to be uh, taken to a shelter, or who are the people in the community who need dialysis or who need insulin. Uh, when, when we turn these properties into just rental, uh, short-term rental property, we lose a lot of that co community cohesion and the social ties. And one last thing is that I've seen that is, is really cool. In the U.S. Virgin Islands, which we don't think about enough, in my opinion, they do roll calls on Facebook where they ask each other, who has power? And everybody's like, oh, I have power in this neighborhood. I have power in this other neighborhood. In a climate of opacity and the lack of data transparency, I think we need to invest in those kinds of user reports. And I think you know, we have tools already. You know, and I want to give a shout out to someone who's here today, Hector Tarrido, uh, who has been developing an application where people can report outages. It's called Apagón. So I encourage folks to really challenge this climate of opacity uh, and the lack of transparency through, through tools like that. So I had a question. 
think it's important to link that to yet another disaster, which is the dismantling of the University of Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of thinking of climate change and how to, to think about it and to reimagine. Um, in order to reimagine, we also need strong education and academic institutions that can actually research what's happening and, and start understanding the things that until now are still uncertain. I mean, many things concerning the climate and the way we used to understand the tropical climate of the Caribbean are changing. And we need a, the research that can provide us with more uh, answers and, 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 and knowledge around that to do all the other things that have been mentioned today uh, regarding social organization, et cetera. But the, the role of research is very important. And with the dismantling of the University of Puerto Rico as the main center of the production of that knowledge um, is adding to the, to the lack of capacity to respond to all these things. And extension services could be providing some of the services that we're talking about in terms of public health, in terms of legal aid, right? Um, in terms of identifying which are the communities that are most vulnerable, where we need to prioritize investment in developing local generation capacities. As, as we're in uh, New York, um, and you know, already you can imagine right now there's in communities across the diaspora, there's different kinds of initiatives that are happening, emails being sent out to raise funds, um, and so in the spirit of also thinking about decolonizing recovery and thinking what role can uh, the diaspora play, I have two questions. One is a specific one about your impressions about um, the diaspora's response uh, to Fiona, whatever impressions you may have of that. And I think it's sort of a broader question, given the past five years, uh, what, what lessons can we learn about sort of diaspora's role in these kinds of issues, uh, projects or initiatives that you felt might have been um, effective or things we might want to avoid. You know, what, is, what should the diaspora be doing? What recommendations you have? Um, any of that would be terrific. Thank you. And one thing I'm excited about is that we're no longer donating to Beatriz Rosselló's like, <laughs> initiative. Like, Folks who now have the malicia, right, to <laughs> identify water sham uh, and clientelistic types of initiatives. And the diaspora has been crucial in really spreading uh, greater awareness about where not to donate as well as where to donate. So I think that's been huge. One thing that I found interesting after Maria is that a lot of those solidarity networks that emerged for the purpose of supporting folks after Maria then became very politicized during 2019 in efforts to oust uh, Governor Ricardo Rosselló. So I see those networks as very important for um, not just decolonizing recovery, but decolonizing Puerto Rico more generally. I, I have a student who um, finished a wonderful dissertation very recently, Ariam Torres Cordero, actually analyzing uh, Chicago communities uh, who activated themselves after Hurricane Maria and the wonderful use of transnational networks to actually gain information about what's needed and actually mobilize strategically for those needs. Uh, one thing is the knee-jerk reaction of like, like Daddy was saying about, oh, I want to send filters, I want to send water, and all of a sudden, what do we do with the lithium batteries and the solar little lights that we all sent, and how is that contributing more trash, and why are we sending water where you can purchase water from local businesses in your community? So all those questions, I think. If we had the right governance systems and structures in place where real-time key information, like Fernando saying about call and response, about roll calls, about what do we need, are activated and those transnational networks are leveraged strategically to actually engage the diaspora could be extremely helpful, especially at the emergency response uh, period. But there's other periods to the reconstruction and the recovery, right? And there's, gonna, gonna, there's, there's always going to come a time where more money is needed because reconstructions and recovery run on money. And more often than not, again, Puerto Ricans do not have a voice or a seat at the table where the decisions that affect us the most are being made. And therefore, the diaspora needs to activate itself on a very much a political platform to actually advocate for the needs of Puerto Rico. 
The midterm elections are coming up, right? So this is important part of our rallying cry. What are we going to do for the people of Puerto Rico to not repeat the same, mista same mistakes of the past reconstruction, right? And that's an important caveat. Don't just send us money. Allow us to have more agency in the governance structures that mm -hmm. are going to affect the day-to-day -day lives of people regarding the reconstruction and moving forward as well. So I think that there's a huge role that the diaspora plays, a huge role. But I think also that we need to build more bridges, uh, you know, fill those divides over time. Because those transnational networks are very powerful, but we need to leverage them accordingly. In addition to that, I, some lessons learned since Hurricane Maria is that a lot of the uh, diaspora uh, organizations, they don't connect to each other. Or they don't like sort of um, uh, work together, right? And I think that's super important nowadays because so, sometimes when they have the same mission, you know, it could be like an organization of three can now become an organization of 15, right? So they're able to um, service more areas in Puerto Rico. I just want to share as an anecdote that after Maria was working with a team of students, uh, undergrad students at the University of Puerto Rico, and one of them shared with me that her family in the diaspora had sent them a huge care package. I think they even sent her a generator. And she said, wow, I didn't know they cared about us so much. Mm. Because for her, there were this like remote family in the Bronx that they didn't have these strong connections to. And, you know, I always think of the young lord's little buttons that say, Tengo a Puerto Rico mi corazón. And I think that a lot of people in Puerto Rico didn't realize, you know, how, to what extent, eh, los boricuas de acá tienen a Puerto Rico en su corazón. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that was something that uh, we want to replicate, that we want to build upon. I think the, the way in people in Puerto Rico uh, think and understand the diaspora has been transformed uh, since Maria because they realized, that, you know, the, the extent to which estaban en el corazón mm. eh, de acá. I want to bring uh, from the chat, um, again, good friend anonymous attendee asks, um, how are we incorporating feminist movements into this conversation, seeing as they have been at the forefront of recovery and social justice mobilizations? And I'll just bundle in a few more. Um, is getting a permanent cut out of the Jones Act for Puerto Rico realistic? And what is the role of agriculture and agroecology in responding to ongoing climate disasters? Anyone else want to pile on to that potpourri? Feel free. <laughs> I don't know if Fede can talk about uh, about this specific part from the policy side, but I do know that there are um, a lot of great things in that bill that could impact Puerto Rico positively. I think the devil's in the rulemaking and in the details and how these programs are actually deployed. One thing is the bill. The other one is the conduits through which these assistance is provided. And again, we don't have a seat at the table to define many of these these processes and procedures, and I think that's going to be paramount of paramount importance. I do think, however, that you know this is a this bill is sort of like a Trojan horse that brings in a lot of very interesting programs that could help uh, rethink our relationship to land, but also to, to climate. And I'm quite hopeful. Let's just say that I'm hopeful, but I'm not um, I'm not holding my breath. Um, so. We live in a colony in Puerto Rico, right? And therefore, it's a big asterisk to what extent are these programs going to be completely extended to Puerto Rico? Or are they going to be partially extended to Puerto Rico? And through which channels? Keep in mind as well that we have a control board in place, imposed by Congress, that actually has control over a lot of the money that comes even from federal sources. So there are a lot of layers, uh, colonial layers, of oversight and of control 
that are probably going to have a direct impact on the possibilities that could emerge out of these, um, these new um, bills that have been passed. I would say that on the ground in Puerto Rico, there's an amazing group of organization, not just feminist movement, which have been doing a lot of work, uh, agro, agro, uh, organic agriculture and uh, agricultura agroecologica, which is uh, how we're normally known in Puerto Rico, doing a lot of amazing work. After Maria, we saw the Centros de Apoyo Mutuo, the mm -hmm. CAMPs, which were a loosely knit network of uh, self-help and uh, mutual aid groups that came up. And I think, um, this is just a hypothesis, we need to keep researching and thinking about this, uh, that they are also uh, at the forefront of the 2019 Ricky Renuncia protest mm -hmm. that ousted a governor, that they are part of a burgeoning civic society movement, that even though they, they work off a of very uh, skimpy budget, they do a lot, especially at a level and at a scale that we seldom see because most of us are focused on the San Juan metro area, as Jennifer mentioned, and we, we fail to see outside uh, of the walls of the San Juan metro area. So we fail to recognize all the, the work, like little ants that they're doing, to actually build a colony of support that actually empowers us and, and leads us maybe to, to different imaginations about what's possible politically. Uh, I'm hopeful, uh, but again, uh, at the same time, we cannot just hang our hat on and put all the pressure on them. So I think that there's, there's a great series of pieces of the puzzle that are in front of us uh, and that we need also to think strategically about how we put pressure on them, but also how we use them strategically to rethink and to imagine alternative futures. I just want to give a shout out to an organization, Taller Salud. Um, I was invited to a panel, uh, I think a month ago, and we were talking about how women in Louisa didn't wait for FEMA to clear the roads. They went out and cleared the roads. And it's an amazing organization. I would like, mm -hmm. take a look into that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yeah, yeah. Please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> a few of you spoke about mobilization, organization. I represent the East Harlem Co-Ed Community Organizations Active in Disasters, another group, the Harlem Emergency Network, Communications Network. Harlem Emergency um, Network, our technical director, was one of the first voices that got into Maria, where most of us are CERT trained, community emergency response team trained under New York City Emergency Management, and we're partners with them. How we got started was we, as CERT, that was the first in, because we're with NISM. Once we got that in, we began to mobilize and create our own teams and creating the um, communications team, different modes of communication, going into the neighborhood, teaching people how to create a family tree, teaching organizations how to mobilize and create a continuity of operations plan, and then <clears throat> branching out. And so as a result of being a partner with them and then with New York City Emergency, uh, not only management, Department of Health, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, we began to develop um, we went everywhere, just like I'm here. I think I'm like the only black person in the room. You know, I show up everywhere. And so when I come to places like this, I want to get information so I can pass it off and let you know who I am. Because while, while we saw that, I was sitting in the only resource center during um, Hurricane Maria, greeting the people as they came from Puerto Rico. And that was a trauma for me because the only people they had ever shared their stories with was with the, their immediate family. Some of them didn't have family. They were just shipped here and left off somewhere by cargo ships in the Bronx at fake addresses, warehouses that were closed. And they met me on the corner. And I saw how the city operates, this government operates. When the lady was talking about out in um, Long Island, how they started to put the building, the houses up on stilts, she didn't gonna respond to the money. It's the haves first. They don't respond to the have-nots unless we force their hand, like you said, sir. Um, you got to embarrass them. And that's what we had to do. We learned those lessons, and that's what we did through the pandemic. Mobilize our organizations that don't like to work together, but those that didn't want to work with us, we said, forget you. We're going to keep moving forward. And as a result of that, 
when all those masks and PPE and vaccines um, centers and testing sites was opening up in the affluent areas mm -hmm. where people refused to wear masks and didn't want to get tested, and we had nothing in East Harlem, not one site, not one vaccination site, not one testing site, yet we had the highest incidence of death and illness. And we absolutely refuse this time to go to somebody else's neighborhood. Like we got to go to somebody else's neighborhood to get decent food, somebody else's neighborhood to get decent medical care. We absolutely refuse to do that. We went right across the street and we did a press conference. We called out everybody from the commissioners, the, the, the health commissioners of the state, all the way down to the governor. And we were the only organizations that the mayor did not attack, <laughs> outwardly. But you know, as a result of that, we had no mask. They was giving us nothing. And then they gave us locations that were wrong. And when people stood on lines for two hours, they never showed up. But in the interim, we connected with so many people. We ended up getting more than a quarter million masks into East Harlem, all kinds of PPE. We have a warehouse in Puerto Rico right now that's standing by. We are now members of the New York City VOAD, volunteer organizations active in disasters. You're aware with them. We are members of that organization. We've got a warehouse down there with supplies, with builders, and everybody else that's ready to go. So we take what we had and we expanded on it and we reached out and reached out and reached out. And so when Maria came and they couldn't get no, and nobody, nobody reported on this, when they couldn't get any communication into, into um, Puerto Rico, our technical chief, Wale Abdur-Noor, who's part of the um, New York Radio, and Zello, we go on Zello, we're creating our own um, internet-free ways of communication. He was one of the first voices that got into Maria simply by staying on the line 24-7. I'm the incident commander of that team. And I said, what you got to do, you got to keep somebody on the phone 24-7, on the radio 24-7, on Zello 24-7, that speaks Spanish, speaks English, speaks different dialects that's coming out of there. And finally, somebody got through. And when they got through, the person couldn't even talk. Mm. They couldn't even talk. They thought they were dead. They said, finally, somebody reached out to us. Right now, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take up so much time. We need to know right now who we can send money to, legitimate agencies. We are not sending a dime to Moya and Shady McGrady Adams. We're not sending him any money because we see every time something happens, the people never get the money. We saw what happened on 181st Street. $1.8 million was raised, and those people are still waiting for a gift card to get a toothbrush and some toothpaste. So I want to leave here today with some legitimate places where this organization, my organization, all of our organizations, and the 67 organizations under New York City VOAD can send money where we know it will help the victims and not pay off the salaries and feed the, the so-called responders. I, I want to say at, at Centro we get asked all the time, you know, I mean, since, since Fiona, where should we send our money, where should we send our money? And part of our, the challenge is that there's actually so many organizations in Puerto Rico doing really good work. And so, I, you know, I, I, I invite, you know, there's a lot of people in this room with a lot of knowledge, firsthand knowledge of the work that these organizations are doing. And I think it also has to do with what kind of uh, work do you want to support? Do you want to support immediate, you know, uh, this week, you know, outreach? Or do you want to support long-term organizing? Do you want to support um, uh, information, you know, uh, looking into the politics of the recovery? You know, there, there are so many issues. But so I will let the panelists maybe shout out some of the, and, and those in the audience as well, some organizations they want to support. Um, for Ayuda Legal and Taller Salud. There is a network of organizations that has come up under the Maria Fund that is actually raising a lot of uh, money. They've, they've collectively, they've learned a lot. This is a group of mostly run by women in Puerto Rico who are actually mm. involved in, 
in disaster emergency um, emergency relief operations. Um, we at the Center for New Economy have a a recovery fund that we use mostly for advocacy and policy making. So the research that re is required later on to figure out what happened and how can we do better, we do a lot of that work. We do a lot of that advocacy work as well. But right now I understand that what we need is boots on the ground and people feeding water and, and also helping people without power. So there's a bunch of groups in Puerto Rico and I would urge you to look at the Maria Fund group that's actually uh, organized under that banner that's actually, that, that's doing great work on the ground right now. So, uh, so kind of last call for comments and questions. Yes. Um, I have a really quick question. Um, as being a, a very outspoken New Yorican, I'm very fortunate to have access to Centro and our research and, you know, the amazing people that we work with. But my question is, people who do not have access to um, these sorts of resources that are in the Bronx or in the diaspora in general, how do they access unbiased information about what's happening on the island? Because a lot of the times we get the two perspective, right? There's a lot of people who feel like, well, people in Puerto Rico don't pay federal taxes, so they're not entitled to federal aid, which is obviously BS. And then the other side of it is, you know, it's a humanitarian issue. We should be down there helping. Um, but how do we get just facts? Or how do we get ac people to have access to these facts that are unbiased, have no opinion, are just like, this is what's needed, this is what needs to be done, and this is how to get it done from where you are. There's a lot of great journalists uh, in Puerto Rico who are doing amazing work documenting what's happening on the ground. Uh, several of them are freelancers, others work within uh, major media conglomerates as well. So there are some names I can give you regarding bylines that you can follow of people who actually do really good journalism, really good investigative journalism, and really good daily journalism, which is very important for us to understand situations on the ground. Uh, these are people who are questioning structures, who are advocating for a, from a human rights perspective, which is actually the best journalism you can do. Uh, and at the same time, there are organizations on the ground that are trying to document what's happening. There's great researchers. You have two of them right here. Uh, my colleagues as well at the center, we're actually trying to also more often than not, figure out what's going on in Puerto Rico and provide an assessment of what's happening. Uh, we're also a nonprofit, right? So we also do a lot of fundraising uh, on that front. It's hard work uh, and it takes time. Uh, we were talking about also building alliances between researchers in the diaspora and in Puerto Rico so that we can respond faster uh, to some of these claims. We know that the government moves faster. Rent-seeking behavior is rampant in Puerto Rico and mm -hmm. It's hard to pin down what they're doing. So we want to organize ourselves as well as researchers to try to figure out, hey, what's going on and can we figure this out faster so that we can do an advocacy push that allows us to tamper uh, and, and put a stop to that. So there's a lot of uh, interesting folks who are doing great work and we've been trained for the last five years to think about these issues, to look deeply into some of the reconstruction and recovery conduits to figure out what's wrong and what's right. And so happy to share those with you as well. Mikey, did you want to say Yeah, um, I think uh, very briefly, you mentioned before that in your research with the Luma contract that you guys did kind of discover what routes can be taken. Because I think right now, um, you know, we have people mobilizing not only in Puerto Rico against Luma, but also in DC. I think today there was a march on DC of uh, Fuera Luma. Um, I think that's the most like, uh, the most angry I've gotten is over the Luma contract and just how many parameters in that contract are very like chock full of corruption hmm. and unethical. Um, and even hearing the story of like a local mayor hiring linemen, right, that are out of the 3,000 linemen that were let go from Luma to actually fix um, some of the grid in their community and Luma turning around and saying they're gonna sue them hmm. for doing that. 
um, on top of Luma, bringing in workers from their own company to do the work in Puerto Rico too. So there's so much, uh, it's unbelievable to me, <laughs> the amount of, of visible evidence uh, in this, in why this contract is so bad. Mm -hmm. um, like at this point that we do have this much visible evidence, what can we actually do with that? And um, what do you guys suggest based on your research are the best ways that are kind of attainable right now um, in the Luma contract situation. Any other final comments or questions? Yes. I just have some interest in terms of um, who's our humanitarian organization that's archiving, you know, the art and culture, you know, from the museums and historical sites in terms of what's happening with that. I know it may not be a priority, I know the people are, but also we have a rich history and resources and um, you know institutions mm. yeah. that you know um, store these things mm. yeah mm -hmm. I think I think that it's a related but a whole we can have a whole other teaching right. about how are we preserving and maybe we should about how are we preserving um, Puerto Rico's cultural and historical patrimony in the wake, not just of disasters, but also of austerity, you know, but yes. Well, Mikey, the, the short answer is we need to rethink a strategy regarding what happens if we cancel the Luma contract or if Luma walks away. There is the possibility that Luma can walk away from its contract as a result. Well, and, 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 and it happened with the water system. Not only keep the money, but actually we have to pay them uh, a substantial amount of money if we finish up the contract uh, during a certain date. This is baked in into the existing contract that Luma has, right? So the key question is, are we thinking about a uh, post-Luma energy future mm. in Puerto Rico? Mm. I know organizations mm. like El Puente, Queremos Sol, researchers like Fernando are thinking about ways of doing that. Have we mobilized politically uh, in ways that allow us to, again, not just imagine, but actually put forward a credible proposal that allows us to shepherd a citizen-driven process that allows us also to convince the reconstruction authorities, which have at least almost $10 billion for grid repair and for the energy system revamping, so that we can think about that alternative future and invest that money in that, in that kind of project. So there's a lot of layers to this that involve, that go beyond Luma yes or no, or whether or not we terminate the contract early or Luma walks away. Mm -hmm. right? So I think that that's, in my mind, what we should be discussing and moving towards. Yeah, I, I think we're so reliant on foundations giving us money to have conversations about this. Um, and often, like, there's not enough public discussion of what is Puerto Rico after Luma. There will be a Puerto Rico after Luma. Luma's not going to stay forever, right? Um, so I think we need more discussions I don't no one should believe anyone that comes out and says I have the perfect solution to this mm -hmm. problem mm -hmm. and we really should bring in interdisciplinary uh, focus community led uh, perspectives to envision uh, and enact uh, post Luma energy management generation and distribution in Puerto Rico <laughs> And this is the final round. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, are, are we at a stage to, to rebuild or build most of the power grid on new ground? Uh, because currently, I would say 90% of what is, is above ground and perhaps a big issue is for the, the grid in general. And to me, tear the power lines down. So how, how realistic is this? It's not very realistic, mm. except in certain cases, uh, one of the reasons why, you know, every time there's a big outage and, and power starts coming back, everybody's like, of course, Plaza Las Americas has power back. <laughs> For now, yeah, they have underground transmission lines. It's, it's a ring, uh, a major transmission line that powers up, among other things, Plaza Las Americas. Um, so for some folks, it has been realistic. But in Puerto Rico, it really isn't. Uh, to have major transmission lines uh, underground. Most of our generation is in the southwest, and a lot of the usage is in the uh, northeast. It, it, it would be practically, uh, it would be actually an environmental catastrophe 
to try to dig uh, transmission lines from the southwest to uh, the northeast. So that's why the idea of decentralizing uh, generation is, is so uh, important and promising. Undergrounding has its risk, and I'll just mention two, flooding and earthquakes. Mm -hmm. So we need to also think about all those other elements that come into mind when we're thinking about it's, it's, it's not the silver bullet solutionism, but you know, it could be a, a, a step forward in certain areas like Fernando's explaining, but it can't be the, the end all be all explanation for how we fix our grid, for example. Um, Federico, any final thoughts? Um, no, just to mention, um, I, I couldn't hear the last the last question well, but um, just to go back to the to life after Luma, um, we the, interestingly enough, you know, before Fiona, we were actually uh, conducting our research on on how to think about um, a public entity that is not the old uh, prepa, um, and then Luma hits. And um, our idea is to uh, start a convening a session where we, uh, as Fernando suggested, we start bringing um, to the table different sectors and different voices to, you know, with, with, with the principle of we still want to defend the idea of a public agency and with the principle that we want to move forward to this transition, um, energy transition. Um, but how, how we do it, that we really deal with one of the biggest challenges that, that PREPA has, which is the governance within PREPA. And, and how we think about that aspect of it um, that goes beyond the technical aspect of the transmission and, and the generation of energy, but also who controls the decisions on how to manage uh, the energy for the people um, and not for, for money. Production. Well, obviously, I have to give the final word to our good friend, anonymous attendee, who asks, I would love to hear each of your goals or wild ideas for Puerto Rican decolonization. Uh, I'm actually, we're not going to answer that today. We're going to be answering that over the course of the year as part of our Bridging the Divides um, decolonization study group, of which this is just the beginning. So everyone, please start dreaming. Thank you.